Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Good stuff this morning. Holy, holy, holy. Just uh, always a sweet time to be able to sing praises and we're off and running and uh, praising the Lord and we're going to open up his word. Join me. Uh, Galatians chapter number 6. Uh, we read a little bit of this last week and then referred to uh, Galatians 5 and the fruit of the spirit, the true vine, the true fruit. And, and so we uh, tied together chapter number 5, which as we have said is quite a chapter in your Bible. There's so many, of course, good chapters, great chapters. It's a chapter filled with so much truth and uh, so much relevance for us believers, for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have the fruit of the Spirit in you, the indwelling fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. And if you're reminded of anything, you, you say, okay, uh, fruit of the Spirit. Maybe I memorized that one day, uh, love, joy, peace, and then you break down. Oh, let me see. Uh, 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 happiness? Uh, uh, niceness? Um, um, yeah, that's good. No, there's nine. And they're singularly spoken of as the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Those are good. And then you get to a place where you say, okay, those last three, those inward workings of the Spirit, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, which I have uh, shared with you is kind of a, a little bit of a, a fun little joke. But there's never been a law that has been written uh, where you will be put in jail for loving people too much, or that you showed the fruit of the Spirit and you said, oh, meekness uh, got me a fine of $100. No, they pulled you over because you were going 100 not because you were showing way too much fruit of the Spirit in your lives. But it says in Galatians 5.25, before we get into our text, something that to me is paramount and free to live faith, and that's that if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Today, we just, hey, believers, we're just, I'm just talking to you for a moment here, believers in the Lord. You may not be born again today. You may be lost. You, you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. So I'm just going to talk to the believers that you remember a day when you called on the name of the Lord. He transformed you, became a new creature in Christ. You understood, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast, you realize that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Saved is a Bible term. Lost is a Bible term. And you're saved. And so you're a believer and the fruit of the Spirit is in you. And it's not a matter of you choosing which ones you like or don't like. They're all there. And each one of them is part of, again, a singular presence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God that wants them all to grow in you. And you and your maturity in the Lord, growing in the grace and knowledge, you may say, hey, I don't necessarily feel like. Well, that's the difficulty is that phrase, I don't feel like. And sometimes we don't feel like. Well, we maybe are just not acting upon what the fruit of the Spirit really is about because we're not in the Word of God to have that word work in you so that you would have the mind of Christ, that you would have the heart of the Lord. Paul said in, Ephesus, in, uh, in Ephesians that he, would, he prayed that the church at Ephesus would know the breadth, width, depth, and height of the, the love of God. They would be able to comprehend that. And when you get a handle on the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, you realize that you are free to live this faith in the Lord, and you're free in a place where Again, the Holy Spirit will exude and pour out from within you his fruit, his livelihood, his incredible love for us. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The interesting part, though, about chapter number 5, lest we forget, is that there was a lot of other things that were included in those 26 verses that referenced some exhortation, some challenges, some, hey, wake up, believer, let me challenge you, because it is a practical set of words in Galatians 5 and 6, after Paul talks about the grace of God and how the grace of God is laid out in chapters 3 and 4, 
to go beyond this legalism and this, hey, I have a license to sin. No, you have a liberty in Christ where you're supposed to live. It says in verse number 1 of chapter 5, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. Yes, I need to stand fast in that. Remember, he's saying a command. And be not entangled together, excuse me, entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He also said in verse number 13, we covered this a couple, two or three weeks ago. For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty. Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. And here's that, that strong statement, but love, but by love serve one another. Okay, so we can gloss over that. Maybe say, ah, well... I don't know, God just kind of snuck that one in there. It was the liberty in Christ that I was supposed to be focused on. No, there is a colon, and then there's a comma, and then there's, hey, but by love serve one another. He also says in verse number 15, on the negative side of how we're supposed to take this incredible relationship and how we're supposed to walk in this liberty, and we're supposed to say, okay, wait a minute. I'm not supposed to be in this place where I would bite and devour one another. I'm supposed to love my neighbor. But he's giving us, again, a challenge in the Spirit of God by the word. Take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. But if ye bite and devour one another, that's, that's a negative connotation about how we're to treat one another. You know I gave you a preview last week of where this message is going. We're going to talk about one another. Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 26, he ends the chapter by saying something else about one another. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Any of you in a spousal relationship here, your husband and wife, you definitely know how to push each other's buttons, don't you? Silence in heaven. Provoke one another. Let's go a little further. You know where the phrase, poke the bear, came from? Don't provoke one another. Let us not be desirous of vainglory. Oh, I am the person that lives in the Spirit and walks in the Spirit. Aren't I wonderful? Now let me look at your life as a legalist and say, hey, you better get your heart right with God. You better get straightened out. I've seen you, and you just don't live. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's so easy to gang up on people and say, let me poke you, push your buttons, provoke one another, and then envy one another. That's not what we're supposed to do with one another. We're supposed to love one another, to forgive one another. This phrase is truly found a great deal in your New Testament. And we, going back to the fruit of the Spirit and going back to our study from chapter number 5 of this liberty in Christ that we have, the, manife- the, the works of the flesh being manifest versus the fruit of the Spirit being manifest, we're going, okay, what kind of walk do I have? Well, we're going to get in chapter 6 real quick here in a minute, and you're going to see there in verse number 1 that God ends this Letter to the Galatians, the churches at Galatia, pretty strong. God's a good finisher, God's great in the middle, and God's great at the end. God doesn't choose one thing or the other, but he finishes chapter 6 pretty powerfully. There's 18 verses, we're going to cover 10 of them this morning, and we're going to see some things about really going to this question that I put before you. What profit will the Holy Spirit fruit do? What will it do for you? What will it do for the body of Christ? What profit will the Holy Spirit fruit make in the lives of God's people if you decided it's for you, just for you? You say, well, I thought my walk with the Lord is very, very important. It is. Yes, yes, yes. But your walk in the Lord, your growth in the Lord, your growth in the Word of God, your growth in the Holy Spirit of God, the fruit growing in you is not for you to consume it. We're so good about consuming. It is for you to give. What profit will the Holy Spirit fruit make in the lives of God's family if we just don't look at one another and see the importance 
of what God has done in our lives? Do we get discipled in the word of God and get trained and mentored and taught the word, admonishing one another so that we can then just be the best that we can be for ourselves? We are to be conformed to the image of Christ. God says, I want you to be like my son Jesus Christ. Who's that going to profit? First of all, his glory. Second of all, one another. Third of all, the gospel that goes out. And we know this to be true. So I ask you, as it says up in the screen, that old song, Casting Crowns, put out years ago, if we are the body, if we are the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, why is his love not showing? Then there is a way, there is a way. There is a few phrases in their song that say something like this. I'll, I'll read it and and. I promise I will not sing him, but it says, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Because very simply this, if the fruit of the Spirit is just for you, then we look at one another and say, that's nice. All of you are important, but you're not as important as me. And here we go with the thinking process of the idea that it's one another. Is the one another mean that I'm going to sit here this morning while that pastor guy starts preaching and thinking, okay, the one another must be someone doing something for me being the one another. Well, it says up on the screen this. Our priority in relationship after the Lord Jesus Christ is one another. You say, duh, I know that. You've mentioned that a few times, and the Word of God talks about it. It talks about it a lot. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. You shall have love one for another. Love for one another. Forgive one another. Admonish one another. Preferring one another. The phrase one another is throughout, again, The New Testament, it tells us something very, very simple. The graces of the Holy Spirit, when they are are revealed in our lives, they are without question the evidence of how much we really believe in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ first then with the saints of God. It really reveals what the body of Christ is all about. And today, the one another, when you look and you see, oh, that's a really complicated title of the message. Oh, yeah, it's really complicated. But one another is who we're supposed to be attending to. You say, well, I need to spend some time on me. Be careful how far that goes. Because David got into the throne room of grace. And he said, purge me with hyssop. Against thee and thee alone have I sinned. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. He got up off of that moment and realized the rest of his life was ahead of him. After sinning against Almighty God. He knew that his life would be difficult, but he knew he needed the spirit of the living God to carry him and walk him through his reign over the nation of Israel as he was in now Jerusalem in the palace. He now knew as a king his responsibility was serious. And now you stop and think of your responsibility, brothers and sisters in the Lord in Jesus Christ. Because now we look at things and go, whoa, one another, one another. Galatians chapter number 6, verses 1 through 10. As we look at this text this morning, start out with a statement that we really need to pay attention to. And take all the way through this text the idea that there are others around us. And unless I handle 
things according to the word, unless I understand what it means to take care of or be around for someone's burdens, the body of Christ is going to get really, really, really weak and tired. Well, you may, wait a minute, does God have a conflict in his Bible because he says that I'm supposed to bear my burden? Yes, you're supposed to bear your burden as well. The meaning of each word is different in the context and the text of the passage. You are to bear one another's burdens, but you're also to bear your burden because they're different. So let's read the text and see what God has to say to us this morning. Then we'll walk through the meaning of these verses and then make some practical application as we always do. It starts out in verse number one, brethren. It's speaking to you and me, brothers and sisters in the Lord. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Wow, three different conditions upon how we are to restore such a one. Verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Is this something new? Jesus Christ says, I give you a new commandment, the love of Jesus Christ, that we are to love one another as Christ loved. So fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 3, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But, verse 4, let every man prove his own work. Then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Wow. Wow. So he came full circle real quick in just five verses that he says, hey, in the scriptures, there's someone that's overcoming a fault. Verse number two, bear one another's burdens, fulfill the law of Christ. But then he comes back in verse five and he says, for every man shall bear his own burden. Both. We need to understand the importance of bearing our burden personally with the Lord. There are burdens that you have personally, bearing your burden, that guess what? No one's going to take them away from you. You see, each one of you in this room, the Bible says, death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. You're the one carrying that burden, as I am carrying it for me. You can't take my last breath away and handle it for me. The suffering that I have in the Lord Jesus Christ is suffering in the Lord. That's the burden that I have to take, that I have to carry. You have to carry yours. But the burdens are different. We'll look at those in a minute. Let's continue in the text in verse number 6 through 10. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. One of the all-time favorite Christian Verses that everyone knows to tell everybody else. <laughs> you know, if you reap, you're going to reap what you sow, you know. We're really good for that, aren't we? In case that wasn't enough, verse number 8 gets really, really personal and gets detailed. Because clearly there's a spiritual thing going on here. We say, ah, oh, it's just, you know, the... The tangible things of this world, but it's spiritual too. Verse number 8 says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap of the flesh. Excuse me. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap of the flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap If we faint not, as we have therefore opportunity, this is good, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Especially those that are of the household of faith. Maybe right now you think, hey, this is again for me. I'm part of the household of faith. You're born again. You're a saint of God. You're a follower, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So people should take better care of me. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Isn't 
wonderful that the Bible says that you're going to be taken good care of by everybody else and you don't have to take care of anyone else yourself. Oh, you kind of twisted that a little bit, yeah. We're good at twisting things when it comes again to the idea that, wait a minute, what's, what's God's word saying? That, hey, you're supposed to do good unto all men. I'm supposed to do good to all men, especially. I'll do good to my neighbor who's lost because I want to win him to Christ, but those people at church now, I don't know, some of them have hurt me. Some of them offended me. In fact, some of them are overcome with faults, and I don't know how to deal with them. When you think about being free to live faith, when you think about what it says in our theme verse, and you know, it's still up there, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It says in the Bible that our flesh is crucified at the moment of salvation. It is said that we are Christ and have crucified the flesh when we called on the name of the Lord to save us. And so as I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, you live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. We know that personal pronouns there, I, 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 I. And now it's not one of those verses where it's about me in terms of I get something in return. It's about me and my personal relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and how serious am I about this faith that I've been given, about this new life that I've been given. And I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. I'm not here to receive from one another. I'm here to do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. I look at these 10 verses with a simple outline and breakdown this way. It's like dealing with family issues. Have you ever had to deal with any family issues? And we have to deal with family issues, and these are family issues for us. But just for the next two, three, four minutes, just, just watch this here for a moment. Because the first three verses show me that restoration is pretty important to God. In family, we're called to reconciliation. We, the Bible says that we are part of, we are called to the ministry of reconciliation, right? 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. It is to be our goal. Our desire to restore people, to bring right relationships to God. Look at that verse 1 again. Where's the word? It's in there. Let's look at it. Restore such and one in the spirit of meekness. Now that's going to take them to be meek. No, 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 no. See, if I'm to restore someone who's overtaken in a fall in the family issue, in that that part of me as a believer in Christ is to do good in the household of saints, then when we look at verse number two, we realize, wow, we, us, we may need to suffer through our brother's problems, not add to them. Restoration. That's something that in these first three verses we see clearly is going to take a spirit of meekness, the Bible says, I'm going to have to consider myself, introspectively look at who I am, humble myself and realize with God, look, I truly am someone, as it says at the end of this verse, susceptible as they are, lest thou also be tempted. Well, that person, they must be so weak in the faith that they can't handle anything, and I cannot believe that they don't understand that no temptation takes them, but such is common to man. But if God is faithful, who we'll suffer them to be tempted. God gave them a way to escape, and they didn't take it, so I cannot believe my family member, my brother and sister in the Lord, they're an absolute mess, and I'll tell you what, if I could just heap coals on their... Whoa. What happened to the spirit of meekness? And this says in verse number four and five, this incredible responsibility we have to grow in the grace and the knowledge. Again, grow. We're to grow in the word of God. We're to grow. We're to study and show ourselves approved unto God. We're to grow as the word of God works in us. The Holy Spirit teaches us that we submit ourselves to some Bible studies and some discipleship stuff and one-on-one -on -one and some group stuff. Right now there's a group being taught the word of God. I say it oftentimes, the investors, they have a group that's being taught the word of God at 9 o'clock. At 9, 9 o'clock in the cafe, there's people teaching and you can... 
you can avail yourself to grow all the time. And you have a responsibility, and I have a responsibility personally, that we would prove our own work, it says in verse 4, and then shall rejoicing in himself and not in another. Say, wow, boy, I tell you what. <laughs> tell you what. Some of those people, they, they, they have such a great walk with the Lord, and I'm never going to have that. And, and I, I'm just, I'm just going to be just, I'm going to be a dummy in the Word of God all my life. Whoa, 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 whoa. You and I are in a place, the Bible says, where we're to bear our own burden. We're to take up our cross daily and follow Jesus Christ. We have a personal responsibility. And when we're dealing with family issues and looking at all this, we say, well, that's just somebody else's responsibility. That's not mine. Well, you have a personal responsibility to grow, to get stronger, to disciple other people, to handle the burden of suffering, death, and the judgment seat of Christ, your own burden. But the burdens of other people... Their faults that they might have, their infirmities that they might have, their, their, their pressures of life, the grief they're going through, the tensions of life daily that they're going through, their weaknesses. We're to bear one another's burdens. Well, that's too much for me. That's why you've got the pastors around there. The pastors can handle that. You have personal responsibility. The Bible teaches me every single one of us have a responsibility. Let him that is taught in the word, it says in verse number 6, Communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. What is the Bible saying? You're a teacher, a disciple, a pastor. You're a parent. You're someone who's invested in other people. How about if you just say thank you for all the people that have poured their lives into you? And now you look at that and go, wow, what a responsibility to communicate that and tell people, wow, thank you for all that you've done. Now I need to be in that place where I would be doing the same thing. Why are we sitting on our doofuses and not getting after it? Why is it that we think that it's everyone else's responsibility? Yesterday we had an incredible time at the Give Thanks picnic. Just a great time. We, I read off 140-something names of people, only, only the people that make Sundays, as I said in my email, sweet. They make it a time of worship, the people that sing and play instruments, the people that are in the welcome team and the info hub and the ushers that are doing stuff, the people that work in the children's ministry. I didn't even recognize what's going on, the investors, the Sunday groups, all the Bible teaching, the discipleship, all that, ADP sports. We were not. We're just talking about what we do on Sundays, and I'm giving thanks and saying, thank you, church family. Thank you, church family. But Paul the Apostle here telling us, which is the Holy Spirit of God telling us, which is the church right now in 2021, we have the uh, importance in our family situation to restore people, a responsibility to take upon ourselves to grow and to be in a place of saying, Lord, use me, work in me, that I would have a reverence for you, God, and, and reverence for others of what they've done for me. And then as it goes into 7, 8, 9, and 10, it says this, you're familiar with it. Hey, there's this principle of reaping. And the positive part of it is what really I'm drawn to. I'm drawn to this point where I realize, look, God, if I would just sow the good seeds of your word. I started tangling myself up here. Hang on a minute. Might be an hour or two. Okay, I'm better. Okay, okay. Where I look at the positive side of sowing the spiritual seeds of the word. If I get into the word of God, if you get into the word, if we, if we really do that, then what's the return and the harvest? The household of faith. People around here are going, wow, thank you for investing in me. Thank you. I want you all just to stop for a minute. Just close your eyes for a second and think of the five different people or three different people that poured their lives into you. Now, who are you pouring your life into? This is our family. We're to grow up together. We're to be there for one another. We're to say, you know what? I need to sow to the Spirit. I need to sow so that the Spirit that shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. That my life looks as though I'm really thinking about eternity. I'm not reaping the flesh stuff because I'm not sowing the flesh stuff. Because I have not been deceived. God is not mocked. 
Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I understand that because I've grown because people have poured their lives into me. Now what am I going to do with all of that? I go back to verse number one. If a man be overcome in fault, which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. How is it that we can let people go? We ultimately reap what we put out. We ultimately look at what we will then put out because someone treated us a certain way and we end up sometimes treating others because they treated us a certain way. We end up reciprocating that. That's not what God wants us to do. You see, this whole package of 10 verses comes down to verse number 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Do you have a special place in your heart for God's people? Not for what they do for you, for what you can do for them. An old pastor used to say this often. It took me a while to understand it, but then as I did, I... He said... Oftentimes, people will be involved in ministry for what the ministry will return for them and not what they will give to others in the ministry. You say, is that prevalent or real? Paul's teaching on it right here. I just get your act together. And I cannot believe you've fallen on the wayside. I taught you better than that. I cannot believe you've come to this place in your life. He says, hey... Watch out. If a man think himself, verse 3, to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. We're all susceptible to being filled with our pride to a point where we think everybody else has got to get it together like me. Well, thank God for you. Because sometimes... We get a little goofy there. Sometimes Paul's teaching to the churches of Galatia really becomes personal. It is about one another. It is about how I see one another. All of you, one another. One another. One another. So think on these things for a little bit. I've got three things that I would like to just lay down for you that are practical pieces of Paul's practical teaching that I believe are really, really just timely. And uh, being a good preacher, of course, you have to have three. Uh, two is not too little. Four is sometimes too many, but three is good. So here's your first one. One another. The Opportunity Church before us, collectively, is to be a people of completion, not competition. You say, I've heard that before. It fits here again. The Bible teaches me in Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 10, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Verse 11 in Colossians 2 says, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The spiritual life that you now have is brand new. You are complete in him. How can I be a person of completion? We are in the body of Christ. We are collectively the people of completion, not competition. Well, I know more than you. I'm better than you. Oh, I know. We would never do that. But we need to be reminded of our, the importance of being complete in Jesus because in Jesus is where our completeness is. Bury with him in baptism, wherein also he arisen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. It says in Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, also laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Colossians 4.12. Those verses there tell us and remind us in Jesus Christ we need to be people of completion, not competition. 
You say, that doesn't happen to me. I don't compete against, compete against other believers. I would never do something like that. Sometimes just by our turning away from a person who's overcome by a fault and saying, they just need to, they just need to, and not being what Paul said for us to do, which is ye that are spiritual, restore. Up on the screen it says a couple of familiar verses to you. John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, Jesus said, that ye love one another as I have loved you. I put there, see also, you can just write them down for later. Let me read a couple of them. John chapter 13, verse 34, similarly spoken by Jesus, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. It says in John 15, 17, these things I command you that you love one another. Romans 13, 8, O man, know nothing, anything but that, but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. When you do not read the word of God, when you do not let the spirit of God speak to you through the word of God, you don't even think about this very much because you think about yourself. When we get into the Word of God continually and continually and continually, we realize that the love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, God working in our faith, faith, meekness, temperance, against such as there is no law, we get to a place where we realize that we can love one another. There should be evidence. Well, you're a very loving church, and people are very loving. I don't look on your heart. That's not my job. But what would happen when the Lord looked on your heart about that? Because we're to do good to the household of faith. You say, we got it down pretty good there, Pastor. We're doing all right. Okay? Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says, Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Oh, do you prefer one another? In honor? Do you honor one another? Do I honor one another? Do we honor one another? That means when you honor someone, they are higher than you. When you prefer one another, you would rather be with them than you. And it's not predicated on a bunch of criteria that you came up with on whether you like their personality or not. In Jesus Christ, we all have friendships and relationships in the household of God with people that you never, ever, ever would have met. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for that. And how would God put up with me and put up with us? It's Jesus Christ in us. Collectively, we are to be in a place of completion, not competition. Secondly, that we are in a place of one another, that the opportunity now, that was collective, that was corporate, that was the bigger picture, now it's individual. The opportunity before us individually is to be a person of restoration. We pointed it out early, earlier, we're to restore. What does it mean to restore, to put back? Psalm 23 you know the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 51, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David knew that relationships needed to be restored. And the first one that needs to be restored is with our Heavenly Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's number one. One another, one another, one another. What, are you mad at us, Pastor? What, don't you think that we love one another? Yes. But the Word of God's teaching us, the churches of Galatia, that we're to bear one another's burdens. We're also to bear our own burden. We need our, I wonder if we understand this. We say we need to win our lost friends and strangers to the Lord. Yes? We need to, we need to lead them, win them. The Bible says, 
He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with them. The Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. Well, what about winning our brother and sister back to the Lord? What is it about us thinking, oh, they'll figure it out someday? Really? I've heard from more than one person over the last number of years pastoring, boy, what would it be like if all the soldiers and saints of the Lord were restored back to the body of Christ? What would we accomplish? If we were a person, if I was a person about restoration and not division. It says up on the screen in Ephesians chapter number 4, you're aware, many of you, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. I need to forbear people? Yes. It means to send back, to relax or loosen the grip, to give up, omit, and calm things. That's part of restoring. It says in Colossians 3, verse number 13, where it says, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Where's our forgiveness? It says in Ephesians 4.32, you know the verse, you tell everybody else this verse, you tell your children, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake. See, you need to forgive your brother. But are we in a place where we're forgiving? To do something pleasant or agreeable, to do a favor to, to show oneself gracious and kind. That's from your Strong's Concordance about the meaning of what it means to forgive. To forgive one another, to hold up one another, to edify people is where we're headed next. And we realize that it takes so much to love one another that others are important. One another, one another, one another. If a man be overcome in a fault, he that is spiritual, restore. Restore. Spirit of meekness. Lastly, one another. The opportunity before us relationally, so we said collectively, individually, and now relationally, to be a church of rebuilding and not dismantling. Now, this building has had a lot of building projects over the years. We have dismantled a lot of walls and put them back together. In fact, I bet you some of you have done a few projects like that around your house. How many of you are in a rebuilding or have rebuilt something in your house or redone something? Raise your hand. How many of you have done a, oh gosh, all of you, yeah, yeah. How many of you are doing it right now? Yeah. How many of you haven't finished yet? <laughs> How many of you started one 20 years ago? It was easier to dismantle, wasn't it? than it was to rebuild. I remember when the faith place and fellowship hall was done and it was started in 2009. They came in and they started jackhammering everything, digging up everything, breaking this, breaking that, so much so that they even broke our main line of the plumbing. They just kept on dismantling things. Put it back together, please. Church, spiritually speaking, sometimes we're good at dismantling things and then we leave them dismantled and we don't rebuild them back. A person that's overcome with a fault that's weak, spiritually speaking, or a person that was really strong in the Lord at one time but then's fallen back, or they're truly a saint, they're born again, they know the Lord, maybe you know someone like that, They've already dismantled their own life. What is it about us that we would dismantle it even more? Paul's saying right here, let every man prove his own work and then have 
he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another to get settled in how you could even accomplish that because every man shall bear his own burden. So I need to bear my own burden of my own life in the Lord, my own walk with the Lord, so that I can walk into someone's life and say, you know what? The opportunity that's before me relationally is to be part of a church that rebuilds people, not dismantles them. When you rebuild something, you repair it. You promote growth. Growth in wisdom, growth in affection, growth in grace, growth in complete virtue and holiness. It says up on the screen there, 1 Thessalonians 4.18 tells me, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. Comfort one another with these words. He even says in verse number 9 in 1 Thessalonians 4, touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you for yourselves are taught of God to love one another. That church at Thessalonica, oh, what a model church. What a beautiful church. The church at Ephesus was like that, but then they left their first love. They left their love of the Lord. They left their love of one another. They were the ones who were endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. They understood love. They understood the fruit of the Spirit. They understood the growth. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify one another, even as also ye do. Please do not be settled in your minds and hearts that we, as a church collectively, or we, as a church relationally, or us individually are at a place where when someone has a fault, they're being put back together. Because I know my office is very busy. And I'm not the only believer in this church. I just happen to be called to a shepherding office, but I am no more than you. And it's not just my job. Or just a pastor's job on staff to restore someone who's been overtaken by a fault. And I'm the only one, or certain people, the deacons and the leaders and the uh, ministry leaders are the ones that are going to do that. No, 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 no. It's for every single one of us. See, the opportunity to bear one another's burden is really a matter of your heart and my heart. It's a matter of our hearts. Do I really want to go there? Well, when you're in the Word of God, it naturally flows. The Holy Spirit of God wants to do that in you, through you. The Word of God's going to come alive. You're going to remember verses and passages of Scripture, and you're going to say, oh my, oh my, that person that I know, oh, that if each one of us would look at what it means to take the opportunity to bear another's burden and we had the right heart attitude about it, or if you were someone that is in a place where you're overtaken by a fault and you turn to someone. But the last thing that I want you to just ask, your question, ask the question of yourself is this as we finish. What heart does the Lord see in us? What heart does the Lord see in me over our brethren? overtaken in a fault. Paul's laying it down for us. And he's saying, we're not to be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another or envying one another. We're to over, we're to be brethren who are, go to a man that is overtaken by a fault. And say, I'd love to be part of you restoring your relationship in the Lord and in the church. Maybe today is a beginning place for that. As I bow, I pray, Father in heaven, as we come to you, really, uh, this is a truth that is so very, very important. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would get a hold of our hearts, that you would have us to see how important it is to look at one another, to open our eyes and our hearts and our lives by the fruit of the Spirit, by the Word of God, to look at one another and to see that God, lives have to be rebuilt, that there needs to be a place of completion in lives, 
And I pray, God, that you would just have your way. Lord God, we put ourselves before you. We ask you in the name of Jesus, have your way in our invitation. In Jesus' name. Please stand.